Yeah, so Lynn, I think you can start when you okay. want to. Um, will you talk about Amy? Will you talk about Amy on June 10th? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so first, uh, thanks everybody for joining us tonight um, on, a, on a beautiful night in, in Chicago or, or wherever you are. Um, and uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about, well, first, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lynn Flackus. I'm the stewardship director at the Chicago Lake Conservancy. And um, I'm not a, a turtle biologist, uh, except I am a naturalist, um, kind of amateur naturalist and lover of turtles. My, my husband would call me um, obsessive about turtles, but um, I really love turtles. So that's why I'm here. Um, a little bit about some of the things that we have coming up at Chicago Lake uh, Conservancy. We have on uh, June 10th, uh, Amy Smogula from the Department of Environmental <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> from the Department of Environmental Services. Um, she's going to be talking about invasive aquatic plants and sharing with us some information about problems that we might have in the lake um, related to those plants that don't belong here, uh, that are easily spread mostly by motorboats, but Chicago Lake doesn't have motorboats, which is good, but they can be spread by uh, footwear and boats and paddles, canoes, kayaks, things like that. So we're hoping that uh, lots of people will, will come to the Zoom meeting and uh, hear about what, what might be in the lake or not, and perhaps come up with some volunteers who might want to do some paddling in the lake and help us with our eyes and ears on the lake to make sure we don't ever have a problem with those species in the lake in the future. Uh, and then we also have a couple stewardship days coming up. We've been having some, uh, some stewardship days where we encourage people to come if they want to with a mask and, and work gloves and their own tools. Last week we had uh, mulch spreading at the grove and we're successful at, at spreading all the mulch from a, a socially distance, uh, safe distance. And we all had masks on and, and uh, managed to get a lot of work done. So we have another one uh, coming up June 5th and June 13th. If you're looking for a little bit of exercise with a view of the lake, um, I hope you'll think about joining us and coming on outside. Maybe the bugs will be gone by then, uh, the black flies. Um, and keep an eye on, on the website for other activities that we may be able to, to put on Zoom programs or um, have in person as things change uh, throughout the state. And uh, if you're not part of our e-news list, uh, feel free to go to the website and log on to that so that you can get the e-news that uh, Juno sends out once a, once a month or sometimes twice a month with some of the events and news around the lake we have going on. Um, so if, if you missed when Juno said uh, about questions, I'll, I'll stop periodically through the talk. If you have questions, uh, you can write in the chat corner any questions you might have, and then we can answer those as we go along. Or if there's a break in my, in my talking and you want to ask one specifically right then, you can do that as well. Um, so I thought I would just start the beginning, if I can fit this into the screen with um, one of the common, the common things that we all know about turtles is they all have a shell. There's no turtle without a, out a shell. That's kind of the defining characteristic that uh, turtles have. So I thought I'd share with you a, a shell. I don't know if you can see it very well. I'll have pictures as well, but this was a snapping turtle that was hit by a car and, and died and I cleaned out the, the shell. Um, the shell of a turtle is actually uh, their ribs and their vertebrae fuse together to form the top part of the shell, which is called the carapace, and then the bottom part of the shell, which is called the plastron. You can kind of think of that as the, the plastron because it plasters the turtle to the ground, um, case of land turtles. And then there's a bridge that connects those two together. So if you look inside the shell, you can see where the backbones were. And there's the, the shoulder girdle and the pelvic girdle in there as well. So there's a layer of bone on a, in a turtle shell. And then the part that you actually touch when you touch a turtle or handle a turtle is um, keratin, which is the same material your fingernails are made of. There's a layer of keratin that grows over that bone, protects the, the skin underneath. Um, and here's a, 
here's a show from another another turtle that had died that is complete. So there's the carapace, and there's the plastron with a different pattern. You can kind of see inside where the where the vertebrae are if the light is just right. But again, I'll show a picture of it in just a minute. Um, so that's really the defining characteristic. Uh, and I'll bring up my screen. Can everybody see that that full screen? Not yet. There we go. Okay, how about that? Yes. That's good. Yep. Okay, great. I'm going to move it over so I get my face out of it. Um, yes, yes. And I'll make it a little bit bigger. So um, we we now know that that one thing that all tur turtles have in common is their their shell, uh, whether it's a hard or a, or a soft shell, like a soft shell turtle or um, the leatherback sea turtle has a kind of rough, rubbery type surface to their shell with bones underneath. Um, all turtles are, are ec ectothermic, which means they're cold blooded. So their body temperature rises and falls with the surrounding ambient temperature. Um, they can't metabolize food and, and create heat uh, by metabolizing food the way mammals can, the way we can. They're all reptiles, they're covered with scales of various colors and textures. They have a very long lifespan and they all lay eggs. There's no exception to that. They all lay eggs and they lay those eggs on land. So even a sea turtle that spends its whole life in the ocean has to come out of the water to lay, to lay its eggs. So those are all the, the common characteristics of, of turtles. And turtles as a group uh, with a shell as part of their bodies um, have been on the, the planet for over 200 million years. So they were roaming around with the dinosaurs. And I think that's why I find them so intriguing is because um, you, you just look at them and they look like dinosaurs in, in many ways. Um, and the fact that they've been on this planet for so long um, makes me want to take care of them and make sure they're around uh, for a long time into the future. Um, Turtles, you can kind of group into, they're, they're well over 300 species around the world, but you can kind of group them into three main, main groups. The sea turtles, which are pretty obvious. They have flippers instead of feet. They spend all their time in the ocean, except for the females that come to shore to lay eggs. Um, the, the tortoises, uh, like the gopher tortoise down on the left here, uh, have large domed shells and elephantine type legs, they spend all their time on land, walking around on land. Um, and then the most of the turtles in the world uh, fall into a group of turtles that are um, kind of aquatic or semi-aquatic. Um, and there's quite a bit of diversity in those particular turtles around the world. Um, they come in all different shapes and sizes. And uh, you know, from the biggest, like the leatherback sea turtle and the Galapagos tortoises, which are, are the largest turtles in the world, to small mud and musk turtles, which are the smallest turtles in the world. And they come in all different colors. And even within an uh, individual species, there's quite a variety of, of color in, the, in that particular species. Um, so they're, they're pretty cool. And, and here in, uh, well, jumping ahead here, but um, so we already talked about the, the carapace and the, the plastron, the two parts of the shell. And in that lower skeleton, you can actually see where the, the hip and shoulder girdles are. They fall within the rib cage. So imagine you're out working in your garden and your shoulder girdle and your hip girdle is, is within your rib cage with all your other internal organs. That's kind of the way um, turtles are designed. They don't have any teeth. They've got a, um, a hard keratinous uh, lip or beak in a way, kind of like a bird beak, same material as a bird beak, that they use for ripping and tearing. Basically, that's their, their knife and fork. Um, they have a fleshy tongue. Uh, you could probably argue that they have a, a pretty good sense of taste, and they have a pretty good sense of sight, uh, even in the murky, murky water. Um, not long distances, but short distances. Good sense of smell. And despite the small size of their brain, their brain is hardwired um, to, to survive their, their daily and yearly um, 
progress through, through life. And that includes uh, migration in terms of sea turtles. It includes moving from wetland to wetland, if it's a snapping turtle or a pink turtle, uh, knowing when to hibernate. Um, all those things are controlled by that little tiny pea-sized brain uh, in that turtle. In New Hampshire, we've got seven different species of turtles, which is pretty good diverse population of turtles for a fairly small state. The um, most common down in the bottom right hand corner is the uh, painted turtle. And the snapping turtle is second, second most common, the, also the largest turtle that we have in the state. And then the musk turtle down in the lower left here is a relatively small turtle, about five or six inches. Um, fairly common, but in the southern third of the state. And then moving up to the top row of turtles on the screen, the wood turtle on the left is a species of special concern found throughout the state, but not in high populations in those different areas. And then the spotted turtle is a threatened species. And then the two in the right-hand corner, the box turtle and, uh, and the Blanding's turtle are both endangered species in the state. And they're found in the southern, mostly southern part of the state. So what we'd see around the Shikaroa Tamworth area would would most likely be paint turtle, snapping turtle, possibly musk turtles, um, and maybe wood turtles. Um, those are those are the ones that we'll we'll go through. Um, starting with a painted turtle, the most common one that you that you'd see is it's pretty easy to identify. It's got a rather smooth shell on the surface, very dark and kind of flat. It's not a big domed shell. That those stripes on the on the side of the head, the yellow stripes are key characteristics. And then these little red uh, stripes along the edge of their carapace. And also you can see them on the underneath the carapace. Those are another characteristic. And they have a an orange or a yellowish lower shell or plaster on. Um, I wanted to stop here just a minute because a lot of times I get questions about how you tell the difference between a male and a female turtle. Um, and every species is a little bit different, but one common, common theme is that their cloaca, their vent, which is at the base of their tail, that's kind of their all-purpose uh, vent in their body where their reproductive organs are stored and where waste comes out and where eggs come out, um, that cloaca in a male extends further out on their longer tail than a, than a female. So it often sticks out past where the top part of the shell is. So that's one characteristic. Although, you know, if the turtle's far away, you can't really see that from a distance. Um, and if it's a big snapping turtle, you might not want to pick it up and, and take a peek at their, their underneath tail. Um, the, the other way with uh, painted turtles is males have very long, luxurious front toenails that they use for caressing the females in their, in their annual courtship. Um, so that you can see with binoculars from a, a little bit more of a distance if they have very long, long toenails. Um, painted turtles are, are turtles of ponds and lakes and marshes, probably a, the most diverse of any of the turtles in the state in terms of what kind of habitat they utilize. Often see them in the early spring kind of pushing each other off the, the available logs and rocks and banks where they're, they're out sunning themselves to bring their body temperature up to a place where they can, they can see themselves. Lynn, there was, a, there was a question about the close-up photos, whether those were showing male or female turtles. So, yep, I'll go back. So this is, uh, there's the cloaca right there. It sticks out beyond that carapace. So that's a male. This is the same one looking at its front you can see it better here, the front toenails, see how long those front toenails are? The back ones are short toenails, but the front are, are long. So this was a male turtle. Can't really tell in that picture, males or females. <laughs> and and um, when, when you get to snapping turtles, there's a question about whether they have teeth also. Ah, okay. Well, um, I have another picture I'll show you in a minute, um, and you can tell me whether there are teeth in there or not. Um, so snapping turtles are, the, are another really common turtle around here. They're the largest turtle, uh, big, huge feet, thick legs, long tails, uh, long, thick tails. And sometimes they look as if their shell is, is just a, a little bit too small. Maybe they're outgrowing their shell. They're not really outgrowing it, but they're just, um, they're, a, they're a turtle that, that maybe doesn't need such protection because they spend most of their time in the water. 
and don't need that huge totally enclosing shell to really tuck everything into. Um, and if you look closely at the lower, this lower snapping turtle, if you peek in there, there are no teeth. So tur no turtles have teeth. They just have that, that hard lip that's like a bird beak. It's very sharp. It's um, keratin, so the same material your fingernails are made of, um, the same material that a bird beak is made of, um, and it's very sharp. So there's their kind of knife and fork way that they use it is they bite onto something and then use their front foot to tear off bite-sized pieces. And that's true of, of most of the turtles. If they grab onto something a little bit too big, they're using their foot to, to rip off bite-sized pieces. Um, so no teeth. Uh, it doesn't mean it wouldn't hurt a lot if you got too close to a snapping turtle or, or even a, you know, a painted turtles can give a pretty good bite if, if, you, if you're harassing them and sticking your fingers in their, in their mouth. Um, Snapping turtles are um, lakes and ponds species, usually muddy bottomed, slow moving rivers. Uh, they don't come out and bask as much as, as painted turtles, so you're less likely to see them on a rock or a log. Doesn't mean they never do that, but you don't see them out quite as much as the painted turtles. And they often bask at the surface of the water, so you see them floating at the surface of the water, um, absorbing that warmth from the, from the sun in the morning. Sometimes they're just uh, uh, sitting at the bottom and waiting for their food to come along. So you can kind of think of them as opportunistic uh, scavengers in a way, taking advantage of anything that comes along, whether it's a, you know, another smaller snapping turtle or a painted turtle or a fish or an insect, frog, salamanders, um, sometimes smaller ducklings. Um, it, it just depends, whatever, whatever's handy. But they also eat a lot of plants too. I think um, snapping turtles get, uh, I, I think, get a bad reputation for being aggressive and mean, and people are afraid they're going to get their toes bitten off when they're swimming. Um, turtles in the in the water, snapping turtles especially, um, aren't very aggressive. If you grab onto the back of a, a snapping turtle shell when it's in the water, it tries really hard to get away. Um, if you pull it out of the water, it's going to try and defend itself, and its only defense then is its, its mouth. So it, it, it will try and snap, and they have very long necks. Um, but for the most part, they're, they're pretty docile in the water, and they just want to find their own space. <laughs> um, and how can you not like that cute little face? Um, the, the muddy, swampy areas of, of lakes and ponds and marshes are shared with uh, one of the smallest turtles in New Hampshire, which is the uh, musk turtle or the stink pot, which you can probably guess by that name that they're, uh, they have a, an odor to them. They have a scent gland that when you handle that turtle, your hands will smell uh, pretty icky afterwards. They um, often are uh, covered with algae, so you don't often see the, the pattern to the shell or the yellow stripes along the side of the head or the throat. Um, they, they tend to have a kind of a domed shell, but, but flattens out a little bit as they, as they age. And then their plastron is, is much smaller. It's not a full plastron like some of the painted turtles that you saw earlier or the, or the wood turtle um, that also has a full plastron. It's just a smaller one, a lot like a, like a snapping turtle. And, and like the snapping turtle, they spend most of their time in the water. They rarely come out um, except to lay eggs. They may bask in the sun at the surface of the water, not so much on the logs or the tree branches around the lake. Uh, the wood turtle is uh, characterized by the bright kind of orange or red around its uh, throat and neck and the front of its legs, which you don't always see if they have their head in their their legs tucked inside, but if you're lucky enough to find one with its head extended, you can see that color and it's very distinctive. Um, their bottom plastron shell is kind of an orangish yellow with black blotches on the, on the margins of that shell. And each of those black blotches is individual to that particular turtle. So every turtle has a different pattern on its, on its belly. Um, which is kind of cool if you're if you're lucky enough to find um, wood turtles then you you can see the different patterns that they have on the bottom of their shell and uh, wood turtles are 
turtles of streams and rivers as opposed to lakes and ponds and marshes, rocky, sandy, gravelly bottomed streams with big uh, riparian or upland areas that they spend quite a bit of time on in the summertime. So in this upper wood turtle one, you can see that kind of golden colored kind of sculpted shape to their top shell, makes it perfect camouflage for lying on the bottom of a stream or a river. And uh, if they're sitting down there and you're walking by, you probably just think it was a rock you were looking at. Really uh, nice. The sunlight rippling down through the, through the water. In the, in the early spring, they uh, come out of the, the stream to bask on the banks of the river. The bottom picture right here, can I, I don't know if you can see where that turtle is, but it's tucked underneath the, the clump of alder here, right on the edge of the stream. If you're walking by again, might just look like a rock. Um, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> and, and if you look carefully, you can just barely see its head sticking out at the top, but um, very well camouflaged in the early spring. And then as the summer goes on, they spend more time in the uplands um, as plants come out, feeding on slugs and other invertebrates and berries and green jewelweed coming up and all sorts of plants and animals in that riparian zone and um, stay very well hidden in the tall plants that are growing along this, the stream. The spotted turtle is uh, threatened in the state and it's, uh, you know, you can probably tell by the, the name spotted turtle, they all have spots. Just like the wood turtle had a different pattern to the blotches on its belly, the spotted turtles have a different pattern to the spots for each individual. So you can identify individual turtles by um, by the spots that they have on their shell. They are a turtle of really shallow, um, kind of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, um, kind of scrub shrub, grassy, tussocky type wetlands with a lot of sphagnum moss, uh, sometimes extensive connected wetlands, one with the other. Uh, but the shallow water um, tucked away in different places is where they, where they make their home. And they're eating a lot of the, the same things that other turtles do, the invertebrates, the uh, frogs and salamanders, and the eggs of frogs and salamanders in the early spring. Oftentimes they're traveling from vernal pool to vernal pool um, in their home range, feeding on that uh, wonderful new growth of amphibians and insects in the spring. And then uh, another turtle that uh, shares habitat with a uh, similar habitat with the spotted turtle. Excuse me. <coughs> is this one, which is the Blanding's turtle. Blanding's turtle is um, an endangered species in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, mostly at the southern, southern part of the state is where they're found. Their characteristic is they have this high domed rounded shell, so much higher and more domed than a painted turtle. If you were to see them next to each other, the painted turtle looks much flatter than, than the Blanding's turtle. They have some flecks of cream colored um, keratin in their, in their shell. And then this bright yellow or pale yellow chin that they have is another characteristic. <coughs> And then this black lip that they have makes them look like they're smiling or they have a mustache. It's another good characteristic. They're a fairly large turtle, um, around seven to 10, ten inches um, at the most. And they, like the spotted turtle, spend some time out of the water in the summertime, traveling from vernal pool to vernal pool or spending time in the uplands around the wetlands that they inhabit, feeding on invertebrates and, and plants, new growth of plants and berries and things like that. So both of the, the spotted turtle and the, and the landing turtle will, will share similar types of habitats, kind of shallow, shallow wetlands as opposed to deep lakes or ponds. Lynn, there's, yeah. there's a question about why these turtles are endangered. Is it diminishing habitat or pollution or? Yep, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a few minutes, but in general, Probably the biggest cause of decline for especially those the Blandings and the spotted turtle um, is the loss of habitat. So in the southern part of the state where there's a lot of building going on and new roads going in, um, they're, you know, they, 
They, um, they may not have their wetlands themselves filled in, although that is, that is an issue of a wetland is drained, but, but the fact that new roads are going in and development is going in to the uplands that they use in the summertime can have an impact on their ability to move around their home range. So that's just one example of for, for declines. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other reasons as we go further on. Um, the last turtle uh, in, in New Hampshire is the box turtle, which is also uh, listed as endangered in the state. They, the scientists, biologists from the state think that there was a historical population in the southern part of the state, but there haven't been any recent breeding populations found um, anywhere within the state. And that's true of the other New England states as well. If you go further south into um, New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, there are populations, more populations of box turtles, but they have the same um, kind of environment conservation issues that the blandings and spotted turtles have in terms of habitat loss and, and roads moving in. Um, but the, the characteristics of the box turtles, they have this big domed shell and uh, large kind of heavy legs and no webbed feet. They spend all their time on land. So they look a little bit like a, like a tortoise, but they're not in the tortoise group of turtles. Um, the reason they're called box turtles is they have a hinge, two hinges actually, on their plaster on their bottom part of their shell. Um, one right there and one right there. So when they, their reason, they're, the way they defend themselves is rather than slipping into the water the way a painted turtle or a snapping turtle would, they bring all their legs and their head and tail inside and they close the doors. And that, and closing that door makes a pretty tight seal that predators like you know raccoons can't reach a paw in and, and pull out a, a leg to chew off or anything like that. Most, mostly strong enough for a dog not to be able to break into the shell or get at the turtle inside. So that's their, that's their defense, um, which works great you know, for the, the native predators that they've, they've always had, but not so much for you know, a car that's driving over them or, or something like that. But um, that's their main defense. And spending all their time on land, they, um, they uh, eat a lot of slugs and, and worms and other invertebrates and lots of different plants and berries and fruits like that. So they, they're a main omnivore. They eat a little bit of everything that they can, that they can find. Um, and one of the, I think one of the really cool things about box turtles is they you know, they, they're all one species, but they, but they have quite a few different color phases to them. And you can, uh, you can see a different kind of pattern and different color in their, in their head and their legs and the, the back of their shell, um, even within the same population of, of box turtles. So going through the um, kind of the life and times of a turtle, sort of the seasonal uh, life and times of a turtle. All the turtles, uh, because they're cold-blooded, can't, can't be walking around in the snow in the wintertime or, or skating around in the ice. So they're uh, underneath the ice, buried in the mud or in the banks of rivers, like a wood turtle. Um, any place where they're not going to freeze. And they uh, are mostly Kind of settled down, although there have been some studies of, of turtles with radio telemetry that biologists have found moving around under the ice slowly in the winter time. They're not expending a lot of energy. Their metabolism is slowed way right down, their body temperatures drop, they're not eating much, if, if anything at all. Um, and what I find really amazing is that is that they survive under there in the mud as a as an animal that breathes with lungs. They can't you know, in the winter, they can't come to the surface and get a breath of air. So how do they get their oxygen? Um, so the turtles all over the world have different strategies for that, but our, but our northeastern turtles absorb oxygen through their, um, their cloaca, or I, I like to think of it as butt breathing in a way. Um, they're not breathing on a regular basis, but that's how they're getting some of their oxygen directly from the water. And then through their, their mouth and the thin layers of skin in their, in their um, their oral cavity as well, bringing water into their mouth, absorbing oxygen through that water, and then expelling that water. 
So again, their, their oxygen demands are, are pretty low in the wintertime, but, but that's how they can survive through until the ice melts and, and spring rolls around. But once the, once the ice is gone, the water is still pretty cold. So most turtles need to come out and really sit out in the sun for a while and, and bask in the sun so that they can uh, metabolize again and, and go in search of food and be able to digest that food. So out on logs, on rocks, at the surface, or in case of a wood turtle, on a sunny little bank next to the river where they absorb that sun's energy early in the spring. Um, a lot of times in the spring, you'll see turtles moving around from wetland to wetland. So they may have a, a wetland where they, where they hibernate. And they might have another wetland that they go to as their first kind of diner. You can think of their diner or their hotel after they emerge from hibernation. Um, so they move around quite a bit in the early spring. A lot of times you'll see them crossing the road in May. Oftentimes it's males and females moving from wetland to wetland. And then June, the end of May into June is nesting season. And that's, that's when you're gonna see them um, oftentimes crossing the road and sometimes nesting right at the side of the road. They're, uh, it's not so great for them. The dirt it might be good for the eggs, but not for the mature turtles that are trying to safely get across the road. Um, they're looking for sandy, gravelly soil that's well-drained and in full sun. Um, the sun is what incubates those eggs once they've, once they've been laid. Sometimes the places are, are few and far between enough that you'll get several turtles nesting in, in one place. They often will dig um, multiple nests, um, kind of um, fake nests, to, to either um, confuse the scavengers that might be looking for a tasty egg morsel to eat, or um, perhaps just looking for the right kind of soil and the right condition to, to deposit their eggs into. They, um, the females dig the, the holes entirely with their back legs. They never look around and figure out whether how deep it is. They just do everything by their back legs. And once they feel that that cavity is deep enough, they deposit those eggs into the hole, cover it back up with their feet, pat it down with their plastron as they walk over it and try to cover up the signs of a, of a nest and then walk away. And that's, they just leave the eggs there. That's true of all the turtles that we have in New Hampshire. There are a few turtles in other parts of the world that that are known to, to watch over their nests for a short period of time after they lay their eggs and then, and then leave them to hatch on their own. Uh, the number of eggs that a turtle lays depends on the, the species. Often it depends on the size. So something like a musk turtle or a spotted turtle, the smallest turtles will maybe lay five to, to seven eggs. Um, something larger like a snapping turtle can lay 40 to 60 eggs. Obviously, the sea turtles are laying hundreds of eggs um, or thousands of eggs. So uh, the eggs are very in, in size and shape. These are um, uh, snapping turtle eggs, which are about the size of a, of a ping pong ball. Um, kind of the almost the same texture, too. They're, they're a parchment texture as opposed to a hard shell like a, like a chicken egg. They sit in the, in the ground for uh, anywhere from 60 to 90 days, but it really depends on the, on the temperature of the, of the soil. Um, warmer temperatures make the embryos develop more quickly. That's true of most, most reptiles, not just turtles. And um, this, this upper picture, this young snapping turtle coming out of this egg, these were artificially incubated eggs. The eggs were at the surface of the soil. When, when turtles hatch out of their eggs, you don't actually see the eggs that they're coming out of. You might see them come out of the ground, but you won't see them come out of the eggs. And uh, oftentimes snapping turtles and painted turtles, if they hatch way late in the fall, will hatch underground and stay underground for their first winter. So I think this is pretty cool. They can survive underground under winter as baby turtles without ever having eaten anything, um, go into hibernation, they have an incredible freeze tolerance. So if, the, if there's a frost level at that, where that nest is, they survive that. And then they hatch out in the spring. They come out of the ground in the spring, um, which is pretty cool. Oops. Um, one of the other really cool things about uh, baby turtles, um, this is true of a lot of reptiles, is that 
there, the um, sex determination of the growing embryos is uh, determined by the temperature in the nest rather than um, genetics. So the, the uh, warmer nests uh, tend to result in females. The cooler nests result in males. Depends on the species. That there's quite a variation in the different species. Some have, um, you know, the, the warmer parts of the nest will have females, the cooler parts will have males, the middle temperature will produce both males and females. So you might get a nest of just males, just females, or mixes of males and females. Um, so you can, you can kind of think about um, one, one concern that, that scientists have with, um, with climate change is how it's going to affect various reptiles around the world. Um, that have that sex determination because it can really skew the ratio of males and females in a, in a population if the, the temperature is rising or falling. Um, but then again, turtles have been around for 200 million years and they've managed to, to adapt to those climate changes in the past. Um, hopefully they'll be able to adapt to it uh, moving forward. Unfortunately, a lot of the uh, eggs never make it to hatching because we have uh, a bunch of um, of scavengers um, uh, like foxes and skunks and raccoons. There are more of those around in urban areas and so a lot of times you can be walking down the road and see bunches of nests, turtle nests that have been dug up by these critters um, just looking for a tasty meal and those, those turtles won't make it. So a lot of uh, young turtles never hatch, they never make it out of the eggs. And then once they hatch, they're pretty small. The one on the left is a painted turtle, size of a quarter. The other two are wood turtles. And uh, so they're, they're, they're pretty small. Snapping, young snapping turtles about the size of a uh, 50 cent piece. So they're pretty small. And, and the first thing they do is they head to um, the nearest water. You know, again, their brain is hardwired to send them to the nearest water, whether they find that uh, because of the increased humidity in a certain direction or the illumination of, of light around a wetland area. Uh, there are all sorts of different theories about how they find their way. Sometimes they have to go great distances. Um, some females go as far as a mile to lay their eggs and uh, those young turtles have to find their way to another wetland. And along the way, of course, there's all sorts of, of things that will look for them to eat. <laughs> And then once they get to the water, they have a whole nother line of, um, of uh, kind of a gauntlet of predators that they have to avoid as they, they put on those first few years of growth. Um, otters and mink and larger turtles and bass and great blue herons and raccoons, um, all sorts of different things that will be looking for those morsels. Once they get to adulthood, then the predation drops quite a bit. So you might wonder how, um, how turtles have survived all these millions of years if so many other animals eat them um, and the eggs never hatch. And it is pretty amazing that um, you know, in, a, in the lifetime of a female turtle who, who may, live, um, may live 100 years if it's a, a snapping turtle or 150 years if it's a box turtle or, or a Galapagos tortoise, in that lifetime, the female's laying eggs every year after she's reached maturity. Um, but in her lifetime, she might only replace herself a handful of times in that population. So mm, a lot of young hatch or don't hatch, a lot of young get eaten, but very few make it to a breeding age to replace the, the female in, the, in that population. Some turtles uh, reach maturity in, in five years. Other turtles reach maturity in 20 years um, or longer. So it's quite a long time before they actually reach that age where they can, they can lay eggs. All these little turtles in this picture are, um, the upper one are spotted turtles. So they're about the size of a dime. And the snapping turtle in the lower left, about the size of a 50 cent piece or a between 50 cent piece and a quarter size. And these little musk turtles are the size of a, uh, a dime as well. Oh, just little tiny, little tiny things. So uh, going back to why turtles are having problems, not just the endangered ones, but the ones that are fairly common have similar issues. So loss of habitat, uh, 
whether it's the upland habitat that they use or the wetlands being drained um, for, for housing or roads or malls or whatever it is, um, those, that habitat loss is the, probably the biggest reason for decline in turtles around the globe. And then the second biggest one is uh, the harvesting of turtles either for food or the pet trade. There's a whole, there's a huge illegal trade in, in turtles around the globe, both for food and, and pet. You, you know, some of you may remember when you were a kid or maybe your kids had the little baby uh, red-eared sliders that you bought in the pet store that um, you know you brought home and you put them in a little aquarium with a with a plastic palm tree and then they escaped and you fed them hamburger because you didn't know better and they died and those turtles are still being sold along with many of the rare turtles. Um, there's a uh, poaching rings all around the world collecting turtles from the wild and shipping them to other countries or bringing them into captivity to, to breed, to raise baby turtles to then, then sell. So between the habitat loss and the global trade in, in turtles, um, illegal trade, there's a huge uh, impact on the populations of turtles. And then I'm sure you've always, you've heard about the, the nets and the plastics in the ocean that affect the sea turtles. Those kinds of things can affect our freshwater turtles too, fishing line or lead lures. Um, are another big impact. And then roads are dividing up uh, turtle habitats. And as I said earlier, the cars have a huge uh, impact on a turtle shell that, that you know, for millions of years, it, it evolved to, to protect them from their predators, but, but not against um, human cars and, and tractors in fields. This was a, a wood turtle actually that was hit by a car, but um, was found with its shell fully healed. So when they do get hit, as long as they haven't broken their back and their legs still work and they're all their, you know, their head works and they can feed, they can sometimes heal on their own. And this wood turtle was a testament to that ability to, to heal. Just like our bones, if we break a bone, they fuse together. As long as, as, long as they're set properly and they don't get infected, um, they, can, they can heal pretty well. This was a painted turtle that was hit by a car and, and the back part of the shell was, was fractured and hanging loose. The, um, the, all the legs worked, the tail worked, the head worked. It was healthy otherwise. And it just needed a little bit of time to bring those uh, pieces of shell together and have the edges of the bones touch each other so that tissue could, could re, regrow. So a little bit of wiring and some, uh, some tape and a few months in rehab and that turtle was, was good to go after those wires and everything was removed again after it was healed. So uh, what can you do to help turtles? Um, probably the, the most common and easiest thing to do is to, to help turtles across the road during the breeding season. Um, when you find them in the road, um, making sure that you do it safely, both for you and the turtle. You know, I'm, I'm one of those people that's really bad at just slamming on my brakes when I see a turtle instead of looking in my mirrors and putting my blinker on and, and pulling off. Um, I, I'm getting better at it. Uh, my son harasses me all the time about it. So I'm getting better at that. And uh, it, you can help turtles across the road if you can do it safely, even snapping turtles. So picking a snapping turtle up by the back of its shell above its back legs, you're not going to get bitten. You grab them by the shell in the front legs, then there's a chance you could get snapped at. Um, I know people who uh, carry snow shovels around in the trunk of their car so that when they find a snapping turtle crossing the road, they can scoop them up in the shovel and, and help them across the road. Or a, a piece of cardboard that they keep in the back of their car so they can kind of scoot it onto the cardboard and then drag the cardboard over to the side of the road. It's always important to move them in the direction that they're headed. They know where they're going, even if you don't think it's the best place to go. If you put them in a different direction, it, chances are they're gonna head right back to where they were going. Um, they're incredible at homing and, and knowing where they're going and you don't wanna turn them around or, or move them to a different pond or anything like that because they're, you know, they, they know where they're going, they know where they live and they, they need to get where they're going. So whatever you can do to help them across, that's awesome. So that's one big way you can help our, our local turtles. 
And the other is just learning who lives in your neighborhood. What, what turtles live in your wetlands? Um, are they rare? Are they common? The state of New Hampshire has a, a reptile and amphibian reporting program that we can, all of us can be citizen sciences and uh, collect information for the, the biologists and submit those report forms. If you go to the New Hampshire Fish and uh, Wildlife site, you can get that form and have it handy if you see anything. Um, so you don't have to be a scientist to help them figure out where turtles are, um, where they're crossing roads, where they're hit, getting hit by cars. A lot of information is being collected on where that's happening so that um, you know, maybe in the future roads can be redesigned or tunnels can be built underneath those roads to allow especially the rare turtles to move safely throughout their, their habitat. Um, no, if you can see in the, in the middle of this photo, there's a gray spot in all that vegetation. That's a wood turtle. Um, and this is my, my dog that I trained to uh, help me find wood turtles on a stream that, I, that I've been um, uh, counting wood turtles on for the state of Maine for, for several years. Uh, they're hard to find in the summertime, so he helps me uh, locate where they are. And I send those reports in to the biologists on on where those turtles are and what kind of habitat they're in. So we can all be part of that. Um, the best way to help is to make sure if you find a, a turtle or any of the amphibians as well is to take a picture so that you can show what you actually saw and make sure you locate exactly where you were when you, when you saw it. Um, so those are all really great ways to help. Um, you know, there are other, other ways to help too, you know, thinking about recycling and doing all the big picture things that reduce and re reuse and recycle um, that keep that waste stream out of turtle habitats, things like that. Um, turtles have been around a long time and uh, it would be a shame if, if humans were the cause of their decline. Uh, but if, uh, if we all work together, we can make sure that they're around in the future. And I'm sure they'll appreciate our, uh, our efforts for that. So that's about it. I'm wondering if there are any other questions that anybody had. Can I share a few that are in the chat box first? Yeah. Um, do they have social relationships with other turtles other than mating? Do they recognize other tur turtles? Do they have any relationship with their young? Uh, they they don't have any relationship with their young because they've, they've deposited their eggs and most of the turtles never, never sit around and guard those eggs at all. So there's no relationship with their young. I, I'm not going to say that they, they might not recognize the smell of a young turtle in a, in a wetland. I, I don't know enough about, about that part. Um, I think probably in captivity there are turtles that have some sort of social relationships. But for the most part, turtles are independent in the wild and only come together during that, that breeding season. Um, you know, I think, as I said with the painted turtles, that, that's the most social you'll probably see is painted turtles all lined up on a log, um, all sharing that space to, uh, yeah. to get warm in the sunshine. There's a question about whether they spread disease. Um, <laughs> So they can. So, so the, the red-eared sliders that were sold in pet stores and, and still are sold in pet stores and online um, can spread salmonella. Um, that was a, an issue with the red-eared sliders. When, when I was a kid, you could get really tiny ones, little ones that were 50 cent size piece. Now there's a law that says you can't sell them less than four inches so that little kids can't put them in their mouths. Um, but there, there is a risk of spreading salmonella, um, you know, and they, they, you know, like any wild animal, they, they would have um, parasites or, or they could have um, diseases, mostly bacterial, but I don't know about any, you know, viruses or things like that. Um, one, of the, one of the concerns with um, turtles in the pet trade is uh, recently uh, uh, people who who buy turtles as pets don't realize that they can live a really long time and they get tired of taking care of them. So they release them into the wild where they, they don't belong. And sometimes turtles can have diseases that are specific to turtles, not necessarily spread to people, but specific to turtles. And if they're released into the wild, 
they can introduce those diseases or those bacteria into the wild population mm. and have an impact on that wild population. Mm. Do they make sounds? Um, they don't have any vocal cords, so they don't make sounds that way. You'll often hear them hissing, and that is a, a result of when they draw their, their head back in quickly, it forces the air out of their, out of their lungs. Um, but they don't have any, uh, any vocal cords, so they don't make sounds in that respect. Um, and then there was a question from Crystal. They adopted a painted turtle, and it's the size of a quarter, so they can't tell if it's female or male yet. Do you know when they'll be? able to and can you tell ever by the length of the tail? You should be able to, even with a small one, um, be able to tell by the, the length of the tail and where that vent is, where that, um, where that cloaca is on the tail. So if, it, if that cloaca or vent extends beyond the upper part of the shell, then it would be a male. But it may, you know, it might be a little hard to tell when they're that little, you might be able to tell, but um, painted turtles get to be mature when they're um, probably about three or four inches. Are, are there other people that would like to ask questions out loud? Lynn, maybe you could stop sharing your screen and then people's, yep. yeah. Yeah, Ken Smith here. Hi, Ken. Hey, how are you? Good. So just two quick comments, actually, for anybody who hasn't already seen, and Lynn I'm, and Juno, I'm assuming you guys have, there's a snapping turtle that, as far as we can tell, basically lives about three or five feet below the little lakeside of the Narrows Bridge. And it grabs onto a couple of rocks, and it sits there, and it waits for whatever prey might come through the channel of the Narrows Bridge. It's there every time we go. It's good size beastie. And uh, it's just, it, it's a wonderful thing to see. Cool. Is the other interesting thing is, you mentioned that the snapping turtles are not aggressive. I was always, you know, sort of raised, oh, they're evil, terrible people. <laughs> so I was on YouTube one time and I saw this video taken by somebody, not one of us, not, not a neighbor, a friend, or anything, just somebody who happened to be paddling in Little Lake. And they were, they, they had some lettuce from their sandwich and they were putting it down at water level and a huge snapping turtle came up and very, very delicately took the little piece of lettuce and sunk back down. And they put another piece of lettuce down and they came back up and the turtle took the lettuce. It, you would, you know, the stories go, oh, you're gonna lose your finger, da 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 da, da. No, <laughs> could not have been more calm and docile. It was, it was getting fed, it was very happy. So those are my two, and, and they were both in Little Lake, by the way. Yeah, cool. So that, the one that's by the Narrows Bridge, is it on the east or the west side of, of where the bridge is? On the Little Lake side, the southern side. Right, but on the, so if you're facing into Little Lake, is it on the left or the right of the bridge, or is it right in the middle of the channel? Little, right, pretty much in the middle of the channel, and it, oh, just, right and it just sits there, and it, it waits for, you know, small ducks and tourists and things like that. And, and maybe the suckers that are, that, are, um, that are spawning there right now. Yeah. Uh -huh. huh. Cool. There's a couple more questions in the chat, Lynn. Can you see them or you want me to read them? Uh, let's see, how big snapping turtles can grow? So uh, about two feet, they, they can get to be about 50 pounds. So they're good size, um, two feet a little bit more. There, there are some, I've, I've seen a really big, one of the biggest snapping turtles I've seen in, in Chicago Lake. Um, it, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Um, so, uh, can turtles be helped by providing sandy areas away from roads for them to lay eggs? Um, that's actually a great question, and, and yes, um, there are, uh, if you do a, a bit of a Google search, you, you can find uh, instructions on what kind of ways to set, set up something like that. I think it's, it's a little bit hard because 
the turtle has to find that particular spot. And, and most adult turtles already know where they're headed and, and are familiar with the place that they're, they're going to nest. But it's kind of like bat boxes, you know, you can put up a bat box and not, and it won't get used for, for years and years and then suddenly there are bats in it. So it may be a little bit like that, but um, there are biologists that are working on, on ways to do that in places um, where there is a lot of development in order to prevent turtles from having to make those crossings of roads. Um, so that's a good idea. Great question. Um, let's see, other chats here. Someone's asking if snapping turtles have tails and if they do, how big do they grow? Uh, they do have tails. They're, they're pretty, pretty big. The, a hatchling snapping turtle has a really long tail, longer than their body even. Um, but as they mature, it, it, um, it's a little bit shorter. But it's, you know, it's probably, well, that doesn't really tell you that, that distance, but um, they're pretty long tails. It's a good characteristic to define them by. Um, and you should never pick up, a, if you're helping a, turtle, a snapping turtle across the road, never pick it up by its tail. That would be a lot like picking up your dog or your cat by the tail. It still has the same sort of impact, even though it looks like they're just attached to the shell. Um, Miriam, do you have a question? Can't see where, um, can't see where they've gone now. Um, if you do, if someone does have a question, you can unmute yourself. And then there's a few more questions in the, um, down at the bottom of the chat right now. Yeah, Lynn. Yep. Um, I wrote a question. Uh, I swim in Shakura Lake. Am I likely to be attacked by a snapping turtle? <laughs> uh, if so, what can I do about it? <laughs> no, I, I think you're very unlikely to be attacked by a snapping turtle. They, they usually go the other direction. Um, oh, that's good to hear. <laughs> and, and your toes don't look that appetizing. I think they know that they're attached to a bigger thing than they can. Yeah, I've, I've seen one uh, when we lived on Silver Lake, uh, actually, uh, uh, just, it just dragged the poor duck down, you know, it, yeah. it just came along and just pulled it down. I suppose yep. it drowned it. Yeah, that's what they, they will do that occasionally with larger animals that they can't swallow whole. So they'll, they'll pull it down stick it under a log and then tear off bite-sized pieces. Um, so they, are both, they, they, they eat both vegetables and meat. Yeah, and, and a lot of carrion, two dead things that they, they find and, and fish and things like that. So they, they have a reputation of eating a lot of ducks. I think that's very few and far between. Uh, is, you know, scientists who oh. study the turtles and, and have found turtles and opened up their stomachs and looked at the contents of their stomachs. Yeah. Um, don't find as many any of those loons or duck ducklings or things like that. Well, that's interesting because I used to see ducks with you know a large brood of ducklings, and then later they the the, the one just weren't so many, and we sort of assumed that they'd been consumed by the turtles. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there are so many there are so many things that eat ducklings that. Practice, yeah. Um, I do see a question here about um, endangered in New Hampshire. Um, with turtles in other regions as a whole, they may not be endangered. Um, is there actual counting to determine endangerment in individual states? That's a, an attempt that all the states do, and, and a number of the New England states especially are working together in working groups on, on the full range of box turtles or the full range of, of wood turtles. And, and that's where, I mean, biologists go out and do as much as they can, but they can't be everywhere all the time. And that's why a lot of states have these- I just highlighted that word. Citizen science type um, projects where, you know, people report turtles that they find and take pictures and send them in because they'll end up finding them in places that they didn't think they were before. Um, so it's really important for, you know, if we're all keeping our eyes open, that really helps the biologists. Um, and there, there are different ways that biologists uh, search for, for turtles. Um, dogs are used for a variety of different turtles. There's, there's um, 
biologists in Massachusetts and Connecticut using dogs to find box turtles. Um, they put radio uh, telemetry on them, follow the females to nesting sites, and then watch the nesting sites to see how many young actually survive, at least, at least hatching. They can't always follow them in, into, the, into the water, but um, there are lots of different ways that they can study that. But the more uh, regular people like us can keep an eye on things, uh, it, it really helps them out to determine how they're doing within their ranges. Uh, so there's a question about how to tell the difference between a, a snapping turtle and normal turtles. Um, snapping turtles have very uh, kind of distinctive pointy snout and uh, a long knobby tail and the top part of their shell um, sometimes has some texture to it, although older ones are, are quite smooth, but really the size is what is the characteristic and, and the fact that they're their legs look so much bigger than, and their body looks so much bigger than the rest of their shell. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the painted turtle, which would be the other common turtle, would be uh, much smaller and have a smooth, dark shell, uh, as opposed to a kind of brownish, brownish shell with a little bit of texture to it. Uh, let's see. Snapper's a danger to our baby loons on the lake. Well, just like the, um, the baby ducklings, they, there are cases of, of snapping turtles taking young loons, um, be when they were pretty small. And it's uh, not as common, I think, as people think, mostly because loons are pretty aggressive parents themselves and keep a good eye on the, on the young ones. I think there's more danger from uh, eagles taking the young loons than, than from snapping turtles. <laughs> see, did I get everybody? Um, I think I got everybody. Um, one other thing I wanted to, to share with you, just um, if you're looking for a little Zen experience with turtles, um, I have a friend who, who put together a YouTube video um, that, that you, can, uh, you can go to YouTube and uh, take a look at. It's, uh, it's called Snappers in the Garden. And uh, it's kind of a fun thing. He set it to music and, and, uh, and his own words and some readings that he did. And it's, it's kind of a fun, relaxing way to enjoy uh, snapping turtles laying eggs in an asparagus garden. And a potato garden. We we can link we can link to that in the next um, in the next e newsletter too. Okay, that sounds good. And um, Johanna's getting some good praise for her turtle zoom background. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? What's the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Uh, so the the well there. That's the funny thing about common names is, is um, turtles and tortoises and terrapins are used across the, across the globe for very similar turtles. But tortoises are, are basically a type of turtle, but tortoises are considered the, the land turtles. So Galapagos tortoise. Um, in this country, we have gopher tortoise and the desert tortoise and the Texas tortoise, um, which are all land-based turtles. Very, very little, if any, time in the water, and they have big big dome shells and big thick legs for, for walking on land. Any other questions? All right, well, Thank you. thanks so much everybody for, for joining us. And, thanks for uh, coming. Thank you. Keep your eyes open for, uh, for turtles this summer and especially on the road in the, in the next month. Thank Turtles you. rock, and so do you. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> Thank you.